But there are all kinds of devils. There are all kinds of grades and hierarchies of devil mass. So a traditional full-scale devil, devil band would have had regular devils. It would have had a dragon. It would have had imps. It would have had... Actually, I have a good idea. Let's do a big round of applause to, to tell everyone that we're actually starting so that everyone can hear. <laughs> right. That usually works. So a, a traditional devil band also would have a bookman, and the bookman is very often the lead devil in the band. So what is the bookman? Unlike a lot of our other traditional masquerades, the bookman is, he doesn't say anything. He's a silent performance. So, you know, midnight robbers give you a, a robber speech. Piero Grenades do their, do their, 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 kind, their, their particular speech. Um, even like, you know, black Indians have their particular chants and songs. But the bookman is completely silent. So. He wears a long flowing robe that's kind of an Elizabethan robe, very ornate. Sometimes it's brocade or tapestry or whatever with a big collar. And he has a huge oversized head, which traditionally was made of papier-mâché, which kind of devil features. And he carries a book. That's why he's called the bookman. And the book is the book of the damned, right? So it's a book where, you, where all the names of everybody who's done something terrible and they're going to hell, they're all written in that book, recorded in that book. So the bookman goes through the band and goes through the crowd and he does a, a mimed performance where he shows people, spectators on the side of the road, where their name is in the Book of the Damned in case they've done something bad. But it's also a form of social commentary because when you look in the bookman's book, you're going to find names there of people like notorious criminals, notorious politicians, notorious politicians who are criminals, <laughs> and, and the other way around. It's a way of, of making a comment about people who, you, who the bookman thinks is, is uh, damaging society in, in some way. So... We don't actually have a bookman here to perform for us this morning, sadly. We tried very hard to find one, and the word we got back was that the bookmen are all either dead or too old to come to perform for us this morning. It is not one of the traditional masquerades that is, that is necessarily thriving. Other forms of devil masks are. Oh, there are blue devils all over the place, thankfully. They're very easy to, get a to see a blue devil to experience that during carnival. Bookmen are kind of few and far between. I have a secret kind of... Um, I've always wanted to play a bookman mass, so maybe now is the time. Maybe, maybe some of us need to come back and, and revive it. And I've always wanted to do it for a very silly, selfish reason. I think it'd be great to walk around in a mask where no one knows who it is and see all my friends in, in the, the crowd and show them their names in the Book of the Damned. So we've asked these three writers to interpret entirely as they please the idea of a tale for the bookman. So the brief is really open. We just said, write us a story that's inspired by the character of the bookman in whatever way. So I haven't heard the stories. I have no idea what they're going to read. Maybe there will be actual bookman characters in them. Maybe there won't. Maybe they'll, they'll, be, maybe they'll be set at carnival time. Maybe they won't. I have no idea. I'm going to find out the same time as you do. So we're going to hear from the three writers. And then once we've got some time, we'll then all the writers will join me up here on stage and we'll talk a bit about the stories that they've written and there'll be a chance for you to ask them questions. So that's all. That's what we're going to do. So what I'll do is I'll introduce the three writers now and then we'll just come up one at a time and read and then we'll have a conversation. So um, maybe we'll just read in alphabetical order because that's the first thing that comes to mind, in which case we're going to have Kevin first, Kevin Jared Hussein, Trinidadian writer, um, his uh, the most recent big achievement was winning the 2018 Commonwealth Short Story Prize. Um, he's published, yes, please. And his most recent novel, which is called The Repenters, was, uh, was long listed for the OCM Bocas Prize either last year or the year before. He's also a winner of, of, of a, a Code Boot Award. Next, we're going to hear from Anton Nimblet, N comes before P. Um, Anton is a Trinidadian writer who for some reason has been living in Brooklyn for a while now, but he's back at the festival this year. Um, his uh, previous book of short stories is called Sections of an Orange. He's got a new book which he's launching on Sunday afternoon at the festival this year called Now After. Very fascinating book. A lot of the pieces in it kind of write back to classic works of, of Caribbean and international fiction. And then last, you'll hear from Alaki Pilgrim, who if you were here at the New Daughters of Africa launch last night, you would have heard Alaki read a uh, writer who we're very excited by and we're very much looking forward to her first book. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say on that. Alaki is, is herself a former regional winner of the, of the um, Commonwealth Short Story Prize. Um, we're very excited to have these three particular writers here for us this morning. So I've said enough. So please, round of applause to so welcome them and we'll start.
well, it's still morning, so good morning. All right. Um, my short story is entitled, An Easy Marriage. My friend from work had a daughter he wanted to give away. He says she was getting old and didn't want she to become an old maid. My first wife I wasn't married to for long. It was arranged. A scorpion sting she while she's putting up clothes on the line. I wasn't home at the time. After she finished, she washed the wound at a standpipe at the edge of the road and went about the rest of the day as normal. Eventually, she collapsed in the kitchen and died in the clinic that same evening. Head bent back, limbs still twitching five minutes after the doctor write down she time of death. I try not to remember it, but if I do remember it, who would? Now, when the man bring his daughter to me, I didn't think she was unattractive. She was just a very plain woman. Gangly, flat, small, thin mouth, eye like she just wake up, hair long and ropey down to she waist. She had the posture of a scolded dog, tail between she legs. Now, let me tell you something. It had woman who liked the self more than they liked the marriage. Woman who eye big and who mouth hot. Happy woman. I know from early, early that happy woman is not for me. Happy woman is stress. The rest of my life was already so damn hard, I just wanted an easy marriage. So my aim was to marry a woman who knew it's good to never get too happy in life. <laughs> Maduri was that type of woman. She was the only one without a husband and she family. So they make the house into she husband. The entire day, she scrub and wash and cook like a Trini Cinderella, you could say. Not to say I's a Trini Prince Charming. Break back work like that, not good for a woman's looks, eh? But it's different when a woman doing work for her husband and her children in a house to call she own because then she actually working towards building something. Now, as I say, Maduri wasn't an unattractive woman. But it had something about Maduri that I think drive all the men away. She used to smoke like a man. And a man don't want a woman who does smell like a man. She was not addicted to the cigarettes. No, it was just part of who she was. Everything else but the woman was unremarkable. But whenever she blew that smoke from she lips, somehow that strangely do it for me. So I let she keep the cigarettes. Now I didn't want no big wedding, just a little civil something, something in the courthouse. And so when it come to sign, you know, the registry, that big book, the marriage officer get this clerk to bring out the book that big, bigger than my belly. Something about this clerk threw Maduri off bad, bad. She frees up, she gets shuppered. Now the man threw me a little bit off too when I first see him. It was not ordinary kind of man. At least no one you expect to see working in a government office. The man had a kind of a goat beard and a slick dung mustache, a kind of curl at the edges. And I don't know how to describe it, but a kind of heat was coming off of him. And he was grinning. Kind of like, you know, how old man is grin like this after they down a shot of whiskey too fast? Like that. <laughs> And he was grinning, and he grin never disappeared from the man's mouth. And the man, like, I don't know if he was a mute, but he never said a word to we. But it had a silence that he bring with him, and a silence started to fill the room. A silence is taken on different forms, eh? It have the type of silence that only occur. Sorry, it have the silence that is linger, and it have the silence that is devour. And it's that type of silence that only occur when you know something listening for you. That type of silence have weight. It could slow things down. Now, we was, always never, we was almost never married because of this man. Because all of a sudden, Maduri get rigor mortis and could name sign she name. I say, woman, don't be stupid. We come all this way already. I done pay my $65. They're going to put your name in this book. So I take, my, I take her hand. I put my hand over hers and I sign her name for her. So Maduri... Was an easy wife. She never had a quarrel with much. I make sure the woman respect time. Make sure she had dinner ready by six. Make sure she was up before the roosters. Make sure she legs was open every Saturday at seven o'clock. I make she into a good, reliable woman, an easy wife. And we was married for two years before she go on and get pregnant. Now she didn't say nothing at first. 
I only notice when she start waking up a couple mornings and vomiting all over the place. It make me wonder why she didn't tell me nothing. Now I was vexed, but at the same time I couldn't be too vexed. Well, I was going to be a father. Duty take over. But the pregnancy come with its problems for Maduri. The biggest one being that she had to stop smoking. This changed everything. The woman was not herself. She was cleaning halfway. The food tasted different. She always had headache, neckache, and backache. One day I come home and I catch the woman staring at a wall. I say, woman, what's wrong with you? She tell me she went to see the doctor. But it was no doctor, she say. I ask her what she mean. He didn't have her no coat. He had no fancy certificate on the wall. She tell me, no, it was not a doctor. The man looked just like the marriage clerk from the courthouse. That grinning man. She said the doctor looked exactly like this man, and he had that same old man whiskey grin like that. Not only that, but he had the same big book with him, the marriage registry book. I say, well, that is madness. Doctors just carry around all kind of big books. Now, the strangest thing was that she said she was answering questions that was never asked. I said, what craziness is this? She eyes was red with tears now. She said the man just... Like he pulled words out of, out of her with his eyes. She even tell him the name we wanted to give the baby, Rohini, which means night. But it wasn't just about the pregnancy she's talking about, it was the marriage. And I asked her, well, what are you talking about? What about we marriage? She didn't want to tell me. I say, hey, girl, just quiet yourself. Is the withdrawal that fucking up your mind, woman? After that, it was like she gave up on life. Stop cooking, cleaning, everything. I still had it in the back of my mind. Something telling me, hold on, just be patient. It will pass. I, as a smart man, I didn't marry no difficult woman. I know what I was doing. At least I thought so, till Madhuri wake me up in the middle of the night to ask me, why you make me sign up for this? She was half asleep. Even in the dark, I could have seen she was barely there. So when I asked her the next day, what the hell you mean? She said she can't remember saying anything like that. This woman was losing she mind. So the next day I went to the clinic with Maduri. I tell her, look, point out to this man who looking like the marriage club. Point out to this doctor. But he was not there. Didn't have no man who looked like that. So I say, girl, you're imagining things. She keeps saying she's not crazy, she's not crazy. Time for, come, time for the baby to be born. The baby still born. <laughs> baby was still born. And the baby was small. Looked like something from some kind of storybook. Just a little bigger than my thumb. They let me hold the baby still. Something was wrong with your mouth. It looked like she nose was be being. It looked like she mouth was being swallowed by she nose. The people say it was a hair lip and something about how she could have suffocated on the mucus or some shit like that. I asked them, well, how that could have happened? How how this baby could have been born like that? Well, they say, if I the smoke. Well, I. I went mad. I pick up a tray full of scalpels and I fling it across the room. And when we reach home, Madhuri didn't say nothing. Just give me this tired look like what was done is done and you have to live with it. I tell Madhuri these exact words. I say, woman, I will bust your fucking mouth if I ever catch you smoking in this house again. And she hit back. Why you make me sign up for this? Why you condemn me to this? Well, I see red. I hit you a hard cough. Then lock she in the closet. I say, you're going to smoke out all them cigarettes that you have. All three packs I have. Even the one that you have hidden under the floorboard. And for the next couple of weeks, she had this constant, tired, sickly, sickening look on she face. Dark bags under she eyes. Hair sweaty and must. The pores on her cheeks big, big. And she was looking like an old hag. But at least she was behaving now. A year later, she get pregnant again. And this time, the baby looked like it was going to come full term. I make sure she wasn't smoking a single cigarette. But then about eight months in, I wake up one night in cold sweat to find out that Madhuri was not in bed next to me. A trail of slimy liquid, too thick to be pee, lead right out of the house. And the door was wide open. But what I could do, I follow it. Outside... It was night, that little streaks of lightning among the stars, silent, the scrimmer mountain hiding a storm behind it. 
And he couldn't see nothing no more, but it had a kind of sulfur smell. And up to a ravine, I see a light, a gas lamp maybe. And it had a figure lying on the ground, squirming. It had to be Maduri. As I run up to her, I see that she was naked, sweaty, hair like a Medusa. But for some reason, all she hair had turned white. It didn't even occur to ask me where all she clothes gone. She legs was wide open, positioned to give birth. It was too late to get to the hospital. What had to happen had to happen now. But Maduri wasn't in no pain. When I see she face, she look up at me and she's grinning. Like it's some kind of joke and I wasn't in on it. And she has said nothing to me. I get down on my knees. I didn't know what to do. So I cup my hands under she vagina like I was specking sweet milk to pour out. And she push and she push and she push. And even through the firelight, I see what come out was the mouth. This grinning mouth come out right between she fucking legs and this baby with this grinning fucking mouth and I didn't even cry and Maduri was just bawling this woman bawling in horror and why all this going on I couldn't do nothing I just get up and I take a few steps back and I watch try not to shit myself but to are we we keep the silence and we remain strong we belly strong Maduri take this grinning baby in she arms and stand up naked in the gas lamp firelight, cradling it like it had nothing else in this world. She had to. Duty take over. And there I stood as the darkness closed in, slowly realizing that this was not a nightmare. I was fully awake. And I tried to convince myself that that was not my wife, and this is not my child. But I'd be lying to myself. Duty take over me. We went back to the house. Maduri sit at the dining table and put a nipple in that grinning baby's mouth. I sit opposite to her, palms to my knees, just watching as this baby ravish her breast like a rabbit bat. The man, had the, book. the man with the book had something to do with this, I'm sure. He had we names. He was everywhere, she say. I couldn't see him, but she could. It was like she was in some kind of personal hell. But to me, any curse could be broken. With a little prayers, anything could happen. As this was happening, I opened the table drawer and I take out my pack of cigarettes. Madhuri looked me right in my eye as I light it on the kitchen stove. I walk over to her and I put the cigarette in her mouth. She inhaled deep and as she blew the smoke towards the ceiling, she closed her eyes and let out a small smile of relief, even though her breast was bleeding now. But the fire was in her mouth and for that moment, anything feel possible. We feel strong in that moment. Nothing feel like condemnation. And in that small moment, with that small smile she had, it feel like we could get through anything together. Thank you. <laughs> morning, morning. Um, is it bad that I feel like I want a cigarette now? <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is um, Bookman in Brooklyn. 1142 AM, Friday. Mr. Kaye stands in shadow. The striped Lord's Bakery awning casts a, sift, a shifting sliver on the meager crumb of a man. Buy me a, buy me, buy me a, He's not fast enough to complete the thought before the woman with the stroller swings into the door. Not fast enough before the MTA conductor breezes past. Not even fast enough when the senior crosses the threshold, gray wisps escaping her hat in unapproved paths. By me, by me, the sun shifts, the sliver narrows. 1.42 p.m. Friday two weeks ago. East 35th Street, Brooklyn, the postman wheels his cart into number 282, and the nondescript man slips in behind him, pauses as if to tie his shoelace or reach for a key. A teenager who cuts school exits, texting. The nondescript man, Kaye self, slips through the second set of doors into the lobby. He heads left off the elevator, presses six. 
He's sure of the floor. This morning, before he pla- be- sorry, this morning, before he paced the east side of the street, looking west, he counted six, with one floor above for neighbors who tread heavy late into the night. Simple now, left to the end of the hall. No, he doesn't know the apartment number. Could be H or B. Could be B. The hallway is empty, 20 yards to the end. Fake wallpaper, drab carpet, doors painted brown now, 10 yards, five. The sound of a lock tumbling, tumbling, two, one. One yard and the sound is 6C right beside 6B. He rushes. After the pacing, the watching, the slipping in, he speeds up to get to the door. A middle-aged man exits 6C, keys in hand. Kaye reaches up to the door jam. 6C locks his own door, turns, focuses on Mr. Kaye. One nose barely 10, 15 inches away from the other. Eyes a blink away. Who you? 6C says. His voice is soft, but the tone commands. Yo, I said, who you? Kaye grasps again at the door jam, moves his hand from the side with the hinge to the side with the lock. It's there. His fingers brush the raised mezuzah just as 6C places a heavy hand on his shoulder. Yo, what you doing, man? Kaye turns, the heavy hand insists. He faces 6C again. He replies not to the question asked, but he says, Friday, 10 o'clock. He points at his wrist, tapping an imagined watch. He points at 6C. What, man, what? what? Friday, 10 o'clock. Kaye walks away, pointing back. The distance grows from 10, 15 inches to 10, 15 feet to 10, 15 yards. Kaye flings open the stairwell door, runs down, listening for footsteps above him. 11.42 p.m. Friday, one week ago. Only the cemetery boy, Kaye thinks, only the cemetery have more trees than these streets. He walks to the house, number 652. Street lights poke through conspiring branches, leave random spots on the railroad, the sidewalk, the wide open lawns. The cloak of the quiet street works. This block looks the way he wanted it to. First floor windows stand dark. Some second floor windows frame lazy late night light. Garrett windows tell stories of teenagers and out-of-town guests. This scene matches the picture he had formed in the space where memory meets imagination. He walks up the semicircular path, takes the four wide wooden stairs, pauses. The short hedge and the creak of the stairs transform open space into something private, specifically belonging to another. He crosses 10 or 15 feet to the door over creaky floorboards. The screened in section of porch amplifies each step. At the door, he spots the mezuzah. It's painted black on the black doorpost. In the instant he reaches up, porch lights flick on and attack the dark, overwhelm the quiet. A dog barks. Despite the intrusion, he completes the arc. He touches the mezuzah, rubs up and down, pictures the Hebrew lettering on the scroll inside. Hear, O Israel. On the downstroke, the front door opens. Kaye charts the the man a foot from him, a sandy red beard, a red knit hat, a plaid shirt. The total, almost a costume, like Halloween. No treat. The dog barks again at the end of Paul Bunyan's leash. Hey, can I help you? The voice, the face, another bark, all pack into the small space of the screened-in porch. Hey, man, can I help you? You okay? He should turn and run or turn and walk with purpose. He should pretend poise. 
Instead, he backs away, edging toward the corner, to the wooden chair with peeling white paint. He sits, but there's no chair. Didn't he see a chair when he walked up? Surely a chair greeted him from there, from that unreliable space. Again, this space amplifies. His thud on the floor echoes. The dog charges, barking, face to face again. Then it's fast. Bunyan hoists Kaye to his feet, arcs an arm around his back, maneuvers him inside the house, sits him in a chair near the door. Fast, too fast, what should be outside is inside. What should be memory or imagination is real. Juice, water, whiskey man? Can you wriggle your fingers, flex your foot? Kaye looks toward the window. Fix it, he says. Huh, Paul Bunyan says, huh? Kaye doesn't reply to the, to the huzz. He points to the window, draws curved lines and arches in the air with his index finger. He stands and points accusingly. He walks to the door then, his hand on the doorknob faster than fast, fix it. He pulls the door and exits. Bunyan calls the dog to heal needlessly. 12.42, p.m. Friday today. He's been on the Shadow Island for an hour. The bakery manager paces, looks, but buy me, buy, buy me. His requests come urgent now, staccato. A woman toting a backpack and a satchel of books stops in her tracks, her hand on the door as he says, me, me. She yanks the door, her blonde ponytail swings wide as she scrambles inside. Kaye points at her, points through the glass, his hand steady, his index finger unwavering. The woman talks to the store manager, her lips falter. She turns and points to Kaye. He points back. The reflection of each pointed finger shimmers, superimposed over the image from the other side of the plate glass. This could be a game, a radical version of Mother May I, or Simon says, a version of the statue craze. He points, she points. A beautiful boy walks past, his unwasted youth sounds a fanfare before him, fronds of light locks brush his back. Mr. Kaye turns, by me, but again the boy is inside before he finishes. He says it now to no one. By me, but the young man pushes open the door, steps halfway back out. The bakery smell dances out the door like a parade, like carnival. The aroma from a dozen different cakes and pies and breads, the revelry of yeast and sugar and spice. The beautiful boy says, eh? Buy me uh, an apple turnover, apple turnover please. The youth goes in, the door closes, but the beautiful boy heard him. The parade remains. If nothing else happens, he's gotten his request into the world. But something else does happen. He hears the sirens first. Different sirens from two directions. He uses converging sound to measure the shrinking distance as if he were an instrument. The flashing lights, orange and red, and red and orange, battle afternoon bright, flood Kaye's island of shadow. He measures 20 yards, 15, 10. The first blue and white pulls in at an angle, almost breaching the berm. The second pulls parallel to the curb, precise. Bodies flow out on the sidewalk, a stream of dark blue uniforms, one, two, three, four, closing space. Kaye raises his right arm, extends his hand, points at the cars, the police officers, one, two, three, four. He turns to the bakery, the woman with the ponytail, the manager, he points to them. He doesn't see the beautiful boy coming through the door, holding a, a crisp white bag like a holy offering. He doesn't see the boy or the bag, he points. 
he hears the gunshots. One, two, three, four. Friday, 2.43 p.m., Thorn Street, San Fernando. He stands in front of a hibiscus fence, a striking figure in the sea of afternoon light. The pavement burns hot through his shoe. At number four, concrete pillars stand useless among weeds. Kaye points to the transformed space. He points. Friday, he says, Friday, 2.42 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin and Anthony. Thank you all for coming. This is Tales of the Bookman. Tales of the Bookman, and it's a spoken word piece. <laughs> He's taken names, taken us for a spin, a waltz, a bow, the perfect gentleman. Look at his robes, not his fangs, such impeccable taste. But watch out, he's two-faced, a whitewashed grave. Under his suit lies seeping wounds and the bones of children buried in tombs, Achille Chambers, Shannon Banfield, Asami, their deaths still cloaked in mystery. Among the silent witnesses, surely someone must know something. No one here is okay. The bookman making lists and taking names, exposing lies and raising cain, marking murderers in his book. He don't get tied up by their looks or their book learning. So well educated, welcomed in the highest circles with Mr. Big and big time criminals, too high up to be gang related. White collar crime, a euphemism for the invisible cloak that they purchase in the right pigment to cover the shipments of drugs in labeled cans of food and guns stacked on the seats of cars shipped from America to Trinidad and back again, signed off on the port with no problem. And where the bookman, he making lists and taking names, snatching hope and making claims in the higher court. He come in for who? For the con man with red Russian ties, running a country with tweets and lies, locking up children like chicken in cage, family separation, orphans made, treating refugees like rubbish, the bookman afraid. He making lists and taking names, rewriting wrongs and spreading stains all over history with indelible ink. Don't worry, they ain't get away. All of those who snap the whip on single mothers living off tips, pay them lower, longer days, who they will go to? They need the pay for hungry mouths seeking bread. The bookman like that, pain goes straight to his head, always writing, writing, he don't get cramp, he end on recording long after our lamps of prayer die out on cold cases unsolved for lack of evidence. Mother's grief, but no forensics. Women and girls, endless disappearance to the sex trade cross border border networks. When you can't tell the difference between police and thief, politician and assassin, predator and priest, soldier and kidnapper, community leader, gang member, businessman and drug baron, protector and pimp, the bookman still have ink. He making notes and taking names, crushing hopes and stoking flames. When everybody know and everybody hear, yet nobody see and nobody care to take the risk to intervene or speak up to authorities, that's not our business, that is the bookman scene. He making lists and taking names, snatching dreams, stockpiling shame. He grandstanding on the lost North Stand, ramaging on endless government plans. Hear his fangs snap round his smile. The treasury empty? No problem, man. No witnesses? The bookman there making notes and taking names, snuffing out hopes, playing hunger games on the nightly news tribute to death, extra, extra for our entertainment. Who he coming for next? 
racist radio announcers, absentee teachers, doctors missing shifts in the public hospital for double lives, double pay as private surgeons, corrupt judges dragged down to the lower courts to defend themselves before a jury of one. Those who show no mercy receive the same, the bookman making lists and taking names, crushing hope, sentimentality, sans humanity, look at that face. The silence, the robe, the mask is ours. The smile, the fangs, the suit, the claws. Watch out for the imps as they coming down, clearing the way for the bookman in tongue, dancing at high society functions, laughing at the rush of the unconscious to eat a food, buy big house, big car, big lies, big head, he'll take us down until the day we find the one to stand in true opposition, a lamb, a savior, a sacrifice, to write our names in the book of life, to speak to dry bones and tell them rise until from Karani to love until each dry river to mafe king we live and laugh and love again under the breath of god's sweet spirit free of lists of dust and death then the bookman's record of deeds and misdeeds will be swallowed up in eternity when justice finally meets mercy the bookman's book will be shut for good by the power of the living word Um, all right, thanks again to the, the three writers. Please, let's thank them again for their, their readings. Kevin, Anton, Alaki. Um, so, so as I said, it was a very open brief for them to interpret a tale for the bookman in any sense, and they've gone in three very different and very fascinating directions. So the first question I want to ask is just a really simple one, is I'll ask each of you, you know, I, I deliberately gave you as broad and as open a brief as possible. I, at least I tried to. So I'm interested to hear what, in, in coming up with how you would approach this, how you would write this tale for the bookman, what was your, what was your thought process, what was your inspiration, what was the thing that, that made it, you know, helped you to find the tale that you were going to tell? I didn't know I was going to... This one? This one, yeah. I didn't know I was going to write. Two weeks ago I got married, I was looking into this big book. It got plenty <laughs> names. <laughs> And the man looked kind of funny, and that was it. <laughs> that, that was, at least that was the beginning of it, the story. Okay, so um, my brother, who's actually the spoken word artist, is not here. He's in China. And he, um, when he heard that I was writing about the bookman, he suggested that I look at Black Stalin's song, Burn Them. Um, you should check it out on YouTube. And in it, Black, Black Stalin takes up a kind of bookman role in that he says he's going to stand next to Apostle Peter and usher into the flames people, in his case, in the case of this song, um, convicted of colonialism and racist acts of violence around the world. So Bota and um, the Ku Klux, a lot of people end up in the flames through, through Black Stalin. And so kind of through the music of that, and also the song, the shouter song, Fire Go Bandem, Fire Go Bandem. And um, that song actually has been reincorporated into a soca song by The Voice. You all should check out all these things on YouTube. The Voice, um, picking up The Voice. Yeah, so um, that kind of musicality is, and that idea of the bookman recording wrongs, social and political wrongs, inspired me. So this was a tough one for me because I don't know that I've written anything based on an assignment since I was maybe like in college, um, which was not yesterday. Um, so what, the way I kind of approached it was definitely not to be literal about it or to try to create a bookman character, but kind of based on my own fears um, and the fears of sort of like um, fears from childhood and ch fears of displacement. And then I, I really wanted the story to kind of like span that Brooklyn back to Trinidad space. So that's kind of what got me into the story. Yeah. 
So the reason we've done this, and some of you might remember, we did a similar event at last year's festival where we got three writers um, to, to do their version of a, a robber speech um, to take the character of the Midnight Robber as inspiration. And that was equally entertaining and equally eye-opening. The reason we do this, oh, and I should also say, I should have said this at the beginning, um, we need to thank the Ministry of uh, Community Development, Culture, and the Arts because they have supported this particular event and several other events in the festival that try to bring together various kinds of our local indigenous performance traditions um, and combine them with, with the literary. Um, so that includes things like the Extempo debate yesterday and the Ulmas competition on Saturday. So um, the idea behind this is simply to... We know that uh, all these different art forms don't exist in a vacuum, so that our writers are listening to our musicians and our artists are looking at our, our dancers and everyone is paying attention to what's happening in Carnival, in Mass, in Calypso, uh, in Steel Band, and they're all influencing each other. So we're trying to, to, to show that there are all kinds of ways back and forth where each one kind of shapes and influences the other. Um, and um, so the idea was to, out of this, we get three new literary works that have been inspired by a traditional mass form. So what I'd like to ask all of, all of you next is, in, separate to this particular piece that you've written, this particular college assignment, Anton was in college last year. It wasn't yesterday, it was last year. <laughs> Let's go with that. <laughs> Separate to this particular assignment, uh, how do you feel in, in your, your own individual writing practices? Do you feel you've been inspired or shaped or in, in some way, not necessarily by, by traditional mass or even by carnival, but by these other cultural traditions, folklore, um, that it exists you know, just around us that are constantly shaping us, that we grow up with, that we hear and that we see, and maybe give us some, perhaps an example or two of ways in which you think you've been, you've been pushed or nudged or pulled in one direction or another by these things that surround us. It's a very long question. I hope it made sense. Kevin. <laughs> well, we live in such a uh, multicultural society, so we have, a, we have a large stock of folklore and mythology and backgrounds on, on the whole. So actually, whenever I feel stuck, I just kind of delve into, into that because it's, it's such a wide, eclectic array of things. So when I was looking up the bookman the, to see what, what I could come up with, the, the thing is, is that the, a, lot of, a lot of what is written, I don't know if it's just, just my opinion, a very literal interpretations of it. And so like you would, you would see the bookman as a character would purely put in you know, that mass setting, or you'd see the midnight robber like in that mass, but you might see it in otherwise too. So I thought that this was an interesting project to kind of get my, my mind working, because I wanted to take that, and I wanted to take some kind of aspect of society, because we have like a lot of old books with plenty of names and yeah so that's that's kind of why I ran with that we have all these kind of archaic things that we have to take down names and things like that and that's why I ran with to, to write my story. Alaki? Yeah I think it, what I found interesting about the book man is probably what I find interesting in all my writing and maybe just in life is um, all the different layers and levels to how that character got created and the character itself because as I started thinking about um, the Gede family of Loa or spirits in Haitian Vodun, so that have to do with death and the crossroads between death and life. So that concept that my African ancestors and our African ancestors would have come with belief systems that they then had to adapt and that adapted and changed and formed new characters to address this situation here, which was a situation of enslavement. And then also thinking of the bookman as a devil character, of course, also I thought of the biblical uh, devil. And I have grown up very much steeped in the Bible, in uh, church, and so, um, and in that Christian faith. And so I, I delved into that dimension of the bookman as well. And then there's, of course, the dimension of carnival, which has to do with a parodying and performance of power, various kinds of what people consider power in a society and introducing other forms of power or questions of power to the equation. So we have words being, and the law, which in our societies, initially the law was to tell some people that they're not fully human, 
That's why the law existed, right? And to enact that violence upon them. And so here you have people who had that brilliance to be able to adapt their belief systems and their experience into a character who would speak to that. Yes, okay, so the Bugman is going to record the legal wrongs and rights and have that power, but he's also going to imply that the power of the society's law is itself corrupted. And so, I mean, it's layers upon layers, and it was just exciting to think about. Yeah, I mean, definitely, we have the tradition that comes from, you know, from ancestors in terms of, of, of the oral tradition and in terms of the griot and that sort of thing. So that, I think, always comes through. But even on a, on a basic level, growing up in Trinidad, being in Trinidad, coming down the street, there is, there's this lively storytelling in people's body language, in like a group of like Shouter Baptists on the corner, in a group in, when I was growing up, there was a man around the corner who, um, you know, he had mental health issues, we would say now, but you know, he would come in in the dead of night uh, and start cursing at the top of his lungs and everybody would hear it. He wielded a stick and he, you know, this is, this is what we grew up with in, in certain ways, good and bad. And so that definitely comes through to my writing, but also other more specific things like the Calypso-like tradition. The first story in my new book is called Pharaoh. And while all the other stories in the book speak back to other writers, to Mr. Lovelace, who's here tonight, to, to Mr. Naipaul, um, to other American and British writers, I wanted a story in there that spoke to a Calypsonian. And Baseman is one of those seminal moments in my life. And so this story speaks to, to Farrell, the Baseman from hell. Um, and it's one of my, well, it's one of my favorite stories. Yeah, favorite children, so it's one of my favorite stories in the book. But that's kind of how it comes into my work. Yeah. I always think, I mean, I have, a, I have a kind of a pet theory that just growing up surrounded by all these different um, performance and in particular masquerade traditions, that there's a way in which even if a lot of our writers, they may not be writing about carnival or about mass, you know, they may not, it may not be a character in the story or may not be the setting, but there's something about the technique that kind of wily kind of way of speaking truth to power that you're talking about, but sometimes obliquely and indirectly from behind a mask or through a performance, because maybe sometimes it's dangerous to just say openly one thing, but you can say it using, you know, the Calypsonian's lyrics or something that sounds like a poem, but it's really that there's something, it's not always, you know, it's not just that, that carnival or mass is the subject, sometimes it's actually like it's the technique almost, so it's the context that we're kind of, anyway. But I'm watching my watch, and I want to make sure that if there's anyone in the audience who wants to ask a question or, or make a comment to any of the writers, that there's an opportunity. So would anyone like to ask a question? Any hands going up? We have a mic at the back of the room. Anybody? Nobody? OK, that's fine. Um, what I want to ask you next is, um, let me think how to ask this question. Um, what I want to ask you next is if any of you would like to ask one of the others something while, <laughs> while I recover from my, my memory lapse. <laughs> would any of you like to ask the, uh, one of the others something about your piece? I have a question for you guys. Um, so when I was, um, when I was writing, and you, so Aguila, you mentioned you know, your Christian background and tradition, and your piece ended in this kind of way to almost balance, because I was like, when I started writing, it's like, okay, I don't want to like invoke too much, you know, too much bookman. Like, what, what is that? What I, I'm careful with how I interact with powers greater than I, and so I'm wondering if you guys kind of had those concerns as you were writing your pieces. It was a bit challenging to write about. I said the bookman does not speak, so he was simply just a presence or something, even just an idea. And just that idea that you, you're constantly being watched and accounted for. So I, I, that's what I kept in mind. And that um, you might not even know that you're being accounted for. And it's, so I just imagine this, this thing that sometimes you just pass on the street and somebody grin to you and you just get this thought. And, or you're just reminded of something. And like to me, like when like when the marriage clerk like give her this grin, 
I wanted to kind of leave it ambiguous that maybe just somebody grin at her and that just remind her and that just bring back, you know, just topple everything and bring everything. So when I was thinking about the bookman, I selected to some kind of higher power. I didn't want him to be so much a part of the thing. I just wanted to be like a presence, like an idea. So that's what I thought. That's what I was thinking about. Yeah, yeah I think it's been a kind of sense of a dual existence um, as somebody having gone um, to school <laughs> in university settings abroad in the UK and in, in the States where I think the concept of life as secular has largely taken over and then coming from Trinidad where that's not the case. I remember Lloyd using limbo as a metaphor for the contortions that you have to use to somehow elegantly get past all these barriers but, but get to where you're going even if you can't walk straight through. And I was just wondering if the three of you, if, there ever, if you've ever had a subject that you, or an idea that you wanted to write about that you, you, you felt you could not go at head on, you could not charge at it, and you had to do that kind of limbo contortion, bobbing and weaving kind of thing to get there in the end, if that's a process you've ever encountered in your writing. I'm kind of smiling because I, I, I feel like everything I do is that. <laughs> like I feel like I go indirectly through most things, you know? Um, and maybe again, it ties back to that connection to culture and how we do things and how I was developed as a child and an adult. And so yeah, I, indirect, there's, I mean, there's, there's a beauty to that, you know? There's a beauty to seeing like a mass man, a mass band cross the stage because they're the sections and it flows in certain kinds of ways, and within each section, there's there are things happening. And so, like, I have no problem like claiming that in terms of how I write, because that is part of who I am and who we are. What I always find fascinating is looking, just to pick up on that, looking at a mass band, say, trying to get in into the savannah, across the stage, and off the stage, is that. There's, you know, there's the costumes and there's the people, but I always like to look at the, the social negotiations that happen around moving these large masses of people with sometimes very different agendas past each other. It's like how you negotiate through space, through that space, and at a first glance it can look like total chaos, but there's actually an order underneath it, and there's, somehow there's a way that everyone understands how they have to move, and there might be flare-ups and disagreements, and, but the bands, they, they keep moving, they know how to move past each other, they know how to make way for each other. There's that kind of negotiation that happens. You know, I always wonder, is it, is it just that there's something very organic about the way we understand how to do this? Or are there like, you know, are the NCC stewards really that good that <laughs> they're keeping everything flowing along? Um, Kevin, the same question that, that Anson answered is, yeah, has you, have you ever encountered a subject that you felt you needed to go at through that kind of contortion? Or do you just feel like you can, I mean, you're a big guy, can you just charge straight in <laughs> and get to where you want to go? Well, most of the time when I'm writing about something that I think would rub people the wrong way, I don't know if the piece I wrote there, because it's very, it's like a toxic masculinity kind of thing, and it's told from that point of view, kind of unapolog unapologetically. I, I don't know, I don't really try to find ways to kind of limbo around it. I just kind of go through and who don't like it, don't like it. <laughs> that, I don't know, that's, that's, that's me. I, um, I guess there might be some ways I would try to, to angle it so it wouldn't be like one relentless just vomit in your face kind of thing, right? So it would be a little more palatable, but I try to keep that in mind. But usually if I have something in my head that I want to write, I write it. Yes. Lucky, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, um, on... I think, I guess what we call race relations, which um, since race is a social construct and yet so powerful in our lives, but not an actual biological thing that really divides us forever, but yet we've made it something that divides us anyway. I think on that topic, um, there are just so many, it's, it's so alive still in Trinidad in a way, and also I sense in a way a lot of us also just want to move past it. We'd like it to go away so that we could move on maybe to something else. But the process that that happens through, I don't think is, it's clearly not simple. And it involves, um, 
it involves, I mean, Bookman made me think about the necessity of acknowledging wrongs, that even in an interpersonal relationship, I can't just be like, well, I'll just act like that didn't happen. If, if I wronged someone or I hurt them in some way, and I feel like on a social level, we are trying to do what we would never do face to face with another human, which is we're trying to be like, let's just get over these things without acknowledging them. And then there's the other dimension of once they're acknowledged, then what? Do we just acknowledge and acknowledge and acknowledge? Or is there a path to repair? Is there a path to healing? And what does that path look like? And you know, again, in, in, in spiritual terms, in terms of faith, there are these concepts of mercy, forgiveness, of you know, all of that. But you know, in a society, if we're going to abandon that, well, what else do we have? You know, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated, but that's a topic that I think it still needs to be addressed. And one more thing I just wanted to say that um, I do feel like writers like Loveless and Salvon are not, are, are right, there are certain writers that just kind of try to clear a path for us here to say we are here, we are present, and this is some, these are some of the questions we have to answer. And I've struggled as a younger writer trying to figure out, well, what role do I have in that now? Because my expression may not be as macro or as um, significant as theirs. And lately I've been thinking a lot about the value of small things, of the value of the inner as well too, that they, they also brought out in their writing. And now that the ground is cleared, maybe we have some space to plant very small seeds um, that might, might speak in a different way. And that seems like a, oh, we do have one question. All right, we're going to. I'm not even sure it's a question okay. or comment, mm -hmm. but I was just thinking that this is really a very interesting um, character for this conference, which is a festival of, a literary festival and festival of words, ideas, the idea of this figure, um, which silence is laid on this figure, mm -hmm. but thank you. I don't know if it makes a difference, right? Because of a loud mouth anyway. Um, <laughs> yes, um, silence laid on this figure, and yet the, 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 the managing to inscribe um, words and names, but also this play between um, the oral and the written, and the idea of, of somehow managing to inscribe. But it's, it's a damaging type of inscription in the sense that one is sort of being written into hell. Um, I don't know. It seems to me as if that in some way connects with the, what you're talking about, whether it's a matter of trying to, to um, negotiate um, something extremely difficult. I don't know if that relates to what we're trying yeah. to do at all. Anyone want to? Yeah, that's a good question from a, a, a novelist who's also a linguist <laughs> to, rem to remind us that there is the, you know, there's the oral and there's the scribal. Well, there's a paradox at the heart of this character. There's a paradox at the heart of your question, you know, and it being a literary festival, and it's a character who is, doesn't speak yet, writes endlessly. And it, there seems to be maybe also a paradox at the heart of us being here. I mean, us meaning Trinidadians and Caribbean people, you know, a very strange kind of, it's a strange condition to find oneself in, to be in a place that you think of as home, but you've been forcibly brought there, or you've been brought there through great suffering, you know? And other people have experiences in other ways in other parts of the world, and that paradox maybe is part of what the Bookman was created subconsciously to address. I don't know, I don't know. Well, that reminds me of something that my friend, the artist Christopher Kozier says, which was that, you know, we were not meant to be a society. The Caribbean was set up as a labor camp. We were not meant to turn into a society or a civilization, but somehow we, I won't say we have done it because it's in process. We are doing it. And that seems like a very apt place to end. So please, I'd like you to thank the writers one more time.